Hi. Um, I'm very much the odd man out here. And not merely because I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I'm neither a psychologist nor any other kind of scientist, nor a philosopher. I'm a student of the intellectual and social history of the kind of Buddhism found in South and Southeast Asia, which is now called Theravada, the way of the elders. Assumed to be continuous with the elders who allegedly, immediately after the Buddha's death, compiled the canon of his teachings, which is, of course, a myth. And especially of the text written in Pali, a language related to Sanskrit. Of late, I've come to be interested in what, in what Buddhism calls, in the standard translation, the perfection of wisdom, though I think a better translation would be excellence in wisdom. When, really, modern Western students of Buddhism consider Buddhist, Hindu, or in general, Eastern ideas, they always focus on the high end of the market, as it were, the enlightening knowledge which liberates the knower from the round of rebirth, samsara. This is, of course, vital and central to the intellectual and spiritual elite of the Theravada tradition. Wisdom here refers to a sophisticated achievement attained gradually during the path to enlightenment, the sequences, morality, concentration, and wisdom standardly defined as seeing things as they really are. The content of this wisdom is the realization of, that is, both understanding and making real in experience, the truth that ultimately there is no self, only a series of psych conditioned psychophysical events which might, if you work hard, come to an end in nirvana. What the non-existence of a self and comes to an end mean means are compl complicated questions which I certainly can't go into here. Um, it's a rather short talk, so there will be time for questions. If anybody wants to connect up this stuff with what was said this morning about mindfulness, I'd be happy to do so. I've been looking at a specific set of Pali texts called the Jatakas, which can be translated birth stories. That is, they are stories of our Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, his lives in the unimaginably many eons between his aspiration to enlightenment and his attainment of it. It's important that these things are narratives, not systematic theory. In them, he appears, usually, though by no means always, as the hero. He's reborn as a human, an animal, or a supernatural being countless times, during which, according to the later tradition's interpretation, he fulfills all ten of the perfections, I would rather say forms of excellence. They are listed but not practiced in the order generosity, morality, renunciation, wisdom, energy, patience, resolution, truth, loving kindness, better translated friendliness, and equanimity. In the Northern and East Asian Mahayana Buddhist traditions, there are said to be six perfections of which wisdom is the last culminating achievement. In Theravada, it always comes fourth in the list, but they're always practiced together. What I want to stress here is the fact that in the birth stories, the excellence of wisdom takes many forms, which can be moral, amoral, or even immoral. And by the way, in passing, the Solomon's judgment story is found in exactly the same form in the Buddhist texts, exactly the same form. So, wisdom is intelligence, savviness, prudence, the capacity to win debates, good strategy, including military planning, technical knowledge, one example is seamanship, the capacity to answer riddles, to solve problems, moral and practical, to succeed in getting a wife, etc. The birth stories include moral tales, along with proverbs, which I think is a very interesting area of thought about wisdom, adventure stories, love stories, reflections on impermanence, death, and the need to leave the world in order to lead the life of an ascetic, advice to kings and the virtues of friendship and the dangers of enmity, that's a very common trope, and many other things. In general, the themes are a combination of and often conflict between the values of self-sufficiency, autonomy on the one hand, and cooperation, sociability on the other. There is much misogyny, alas, but there are stories about wise women. A wise person knows how to cultivate friends, but also recognize and, where necessary, harm enemies. These birth stories, like Aesop's fables, are often simplified and seen as didactic children's stories, but in fact, many of them are morally complex, exploring values and their conflicts rather than solving them. Living with such complexity and conflict 
is part of what wisdom in this kind of literature means. Here is but one short example of a story said by the text to be about excellence in wisdom. It's the smart monkey and the foolish crocodile. And of course, the future Buddha is the monkey. <clears throat> a monkey lives on the, ba on the bank of the river Ganges, in which live a crocodile and his wife. The crocodile's wife conceives a pregnancy longing to eat the monkey's heart and asks her husband to get it. He tells the monkey that on the other side of the Ganges there are many excellent fruit trees and offers to carry him on his back across the river to eat them. The monkey, not showing much wisdom at this point, though perhaps an excess of the virtue of trust, agrees. Halfway across, the crocodile starts to sink lower in the water. The monkey, alarmed, asks what's going on, and the crocodile explains his real purpose. Why, says the monkey, we monkeys don't keep our hearts in our chests. If we did so, then while we're jumping around in trees, our hearts would be crushed to powder. We keep them hanging on trees. And he points to some heart-shaped fruits on the bank of the river. The crocodile accepts this and takes him back to the bank. The monkey gets off his back, escapes, and mocks the crocodile. I have outwitted you, as the verb often means to deceive. Your body is large, but your wisdom is small. So wisdom in this story involves lying. I'd like to see more comparative historical and textual work than currently exists on what I like to call wisdom literature worldwide, although this phrase is often restricted to certain texts of the Old Testament and the ancient Near East. There is, to my knowledge, only one such book, which is useful but surely not the last word. It's by Wanda Ostrovska Kaufman, and it's called The Anthropology of Wisdom Literature. It came out in 1996. Perhaps rather perversely, she uses the ancient and medieval European category of the exemplum as a descriptive and analytical device. But she does consider Hindu as well as ancient and medieval European wisdom literature, though not Buddhist. Is wisdom in Buddhism associated with age? No. There is in Hinduism a well-known model where asceticism and the search for truth and wisdom are said to be the fourth of four consecutive life stages. First, studentship, then marriage and childbearing, then forest dwelling, and lastly, renunciation. But in Buddhist texts and in Buddhist countries now, men and women often renounce, i.e. become monks or nuns, at a young age. Many stories have wise children and youths, and in the texts, at least, enlightenment is available to all, men and women, young or old. The issue of whether enlightenment is possible in fact for anyone in the modern world is, however, much debated. A full life in Buddhism is said to be 100 years. This must have been wildly unlikely in the pre-modern world for most people. I assume the idea is that then, as it is now, 100 years is about as much as anyone can expect. I'll end my remarks on Buddhism with a strange and striking quotation from a 4th to 5th century compendium of Pali scholasticism. It goes like this. The first 10 years of a person with 100 years life are called the tender decade, for then he is a tender, unsteady child. The next 10 years are called the sport decade, for he's very fond of sport then. The next 10 years, the 20s, are the called the beauty decade, for his beauty reaches its fullest extent then. The next 10 years, the 30s, are called the strength decade, for his strength and power reach their full extent then. The next 10 years, the 40s, are called the wisdom decade, for his wisdom is well established by then. Even in one naturally weak in wisdom, some wisdom, it seems, arises at that time. Here comes the bad news. <laughs> the next 10 years, the 50s, are called the decline decade, for his fondness for sport and his beauty, strength, and wisdom decline then. The next 10 years, 60s, are called the stooping decade, for his figure stoops forward then. The next 10 years, the 70s, are called the bent decade, for his figure then becomes bent like the end of a plough. The next 10 years, the 80s, are called the dotage decade, for he is doting then and forgets what he does. The next 10 years, the 90s, are called the prone decade, for a centenarian mostly lies prone. So if you're past 49, you're too late, you know. 
<laughs> I'll end with a remark which is probably obvious to everyone here about definitions and heterogeneity in the concept of wisdom. When modern philosophers and psychologists set about studying wisdom, they are right to try to define it. Philosophers for the sake of conceptual clarity, psychologists for that reason, and also to be able to, to produce clear-cut results in their experiments. But in studying wisdom literature, whether in one tradition or comparatively, and I venture to say in modern ethnography, I think one must recognize that the concept and of wisdom and indigenous correlates of it are irremediably heterogeneous. Concepts of wisdom within cultures and languages as well as across them may have, in that rather overused phrase of Wittgenstein's, a family resemblance, but that's all they have. I, I get the record for shortness, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should stoop over here. <laughs> Questions? Valerie? Thank you. Could, you. could you say a little bit about what goes into translating the word in these documents as wisdom? Because I'm, sure. I'm thinking in the, in the Western philosophical tradition, um, immoral wisdom would, would really be an oxymoron, and uh, immoral cleverness uh, would be fine, but not immoral wisdom. So I'm curious how, how the words get translated, how people think about that. The, the main word used um, in the perfection of wisdom is from a, a Sanskrit root, nya, to know, which is an Indo-European correlate of gignosko in Greek and kognoskai in Latin. So it's basically just a, a, a verb of knowing. Um, there are, a number, uh, of course, a large number of different words which could be translated as wisdom, but that is the central technical term. Um, and you think wisdom is a, a better translation than knowledge? Depends on the context. I mean, I don't, in translating, uh, somebody once said, translation is impossible but, but necessary. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you ha it depends on what context. Um, I'm quite happy to say that the monkey was wise. <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't just say he was smart or clever or something. I think he was wise. Saved his life after all. So somewhat related to that question, um, you describe about the, uh, the meaning of wisdom in Pali. That's the yeah. classic original uh, language that Buddha used, supposedly. But mm, then that's what some people think, yes. Right. But then eventually they, uh, people rewrote uh, again and again and again, especially in Sanskrit, which is more formal language, what was the, the evolution of meaning of uh, wisdom in that transition? That's the first question. The second question is, oh, yeah, yeah, the second question is that how important is that written text was to the Buddhist tradition of wisdom compared to, let's say, Old Testament, New Testament, how important that was to the Western uh, tradition? I'm not sure that I really get the second uh, question, but in answer to the first question, if you Google for Buddhist with Buddhism and wisdom, that you'll get endless things about a series of Mahayana texts called the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. And that there, the perfection specifically is what I call the higher end of the market. It's kind of spiritual and highfalutin and you know, deep and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm in interested more in getting a variegated sense of what the excellence of wisdom is across different kinds of Buddhist literature. And I'd certainly like to do, see more comparative work you know, uh, there, and there obviously one's likely to, as one always does in comparative work, you'll find similarities and differences in different wisdom traditions um, of different countries. But can you rephrase the second question? The second question, it seems like uh, in, in Asia, in East, back then, it seems to be more oral than, than written text-based tradition. So is how important the written text is today in the East, uh, uh, with, with you know wisdom related text Where, whereas in the west it's the uh, the bible you know old and new and and that sure. that's very important sure. orality and literacy is a huge huge subject which i could spend the next week talking about <laughs> um well they've had writing in india since uh, well writing since at least the fifth century bc it wasn't used for writing down so-called religious texts until somewhat later um Many of these stories, the, the Jataka birth stories that I'm talking about, I read them in Pali, which, and in fact, they're rather sophisticated. 
sometimes the verses are very, very difficult to, un to understand. It's always called a popular literature, but of course n no, no ordinary Buddhist could possibly read this text. What tends to happen is that you have vernacular versions of them. I would love to see some empirical ethnographic research on how these stories turn out when they're given in sermons. You know. But that is like 99% sort of, of other questions that we'd like to know about Buddhist ethnography, we just don't know. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there was a debate about whether enlightenment is possible. Yeah. Uh, and uh, since, uh, since in the Buddhist tradition, enlightenment and wisdom are so closely interrelated, it's probably valuable for us to, ta to be aware that there we do have actual empirical research on this now, and I think perhaps some of the most interesting studies are the Brown and Engler studies of perceptual processing using Rorschach tests and finding very distinct patterns of responses at, in people who are nominated and uh, in several ways as having reached various stages of the four classic stages of enlightenment in Theravadan Buddhist tradition. And the yeah. people at the first stage show very distinct patterns, and the people that say the third stage show another entirely different pattern. In fact, a unique pattern that has only been seen in uh, very rarely indeed. So I think we do have some research indicating this. And maybe I'll make one very interesting point which comes back to what something several people have said. Several people have mentioned the importance of acceptance in wisdom. And one of the, one of the key features of the people at the first stage of enlightenment is actually Surprisingly, we at first look at these patterns, they don't look all that different from the rest of us. Ex they have neuroses around this and that. The really distinguishing feature is they're not bothered by them. And when you actually talk to some of these people, and I've had the privilege of interviewing some of them, they kind of take their neuroses as kind of being very amusing. <laughs> they're, not, they're not worried by them. In fact, they kind of just trot them out and discuss them and use them, use them as teaching stories. So, I, th I think we do have some actual evidence on this question. Um, I would agree with that. Howard. No doubt people can be wiser and more enlightened. Uh, when I say p people uh, debate whether enlightenment is possible, I mean the traditional pre-modern, pre-scientific notion that there is a kind of ontological event called enlightenment which takes place. As far as I'm concerned, it's a social status. Is there another question? Ah. It's striking uh, how often we find the wise person or wisdom being communicated or communicating through maxims, proverbs, oh, yes. parables, uh, stories that invite reflection, uh, often pithy stories like mm -hmm. the short one you read. Uh, I wonder if you could just talk about the process of uh, the educative process or role that these play in uh, handing down uh, an interpretation of excellence and wisdom from one mm -hmm. generation to the next. Well, of course, many more people hear these stories than read books of philosophy. <laughs> it's obviously, obviously the case. Um, I used to, in a book I wrote some time ago, I made a big fuss following Jerome Bruner about the distinction between systematic and narrative thought. And I think it is an important distinction. And I certainly think narratives can do things with wisdom as with anything else that systematic thought can't do. I've been asking myself recently where to put proverbs in that distinction because they're neither systematic nor, nor, nor are they stories. But they're clearly, culturally speaking, one of the main uh, textual ways in which wisdom is, is, uh, is kind of passed on. But, uh, um, Ian and then Ursula. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ursula and then. Oh. Point out about the Proverbs. I mean, what you just said, uh, it occurred to me that the Proverbs, although they don't have the, um, the distancing of the systematic knowledge, they bring things closer, right? So they're not a narrative about a self, but as opposed to Igor's work and some other work here about distancing and emotional distance, Proverbs usually have something that allows you to connect your own experience to them directly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to something mm -hmm. else, just a thought. Well, Proverbs are also very heterogeneous. Right? You can always find a problem to suit the occasion. 
A stitch in time saves ni nine <laughs> more haste, less speed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wanted but to I'm keen on heterogeneity. As you I wanted said. to actually point that out, that it is not the Proverbs itself, because you find a good saying for almost everything. Yes. It is to know when yes, to exactly. pull the right proverb, yes. Yes. and that's the key. Yeah. Thank you.